Hello team, welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself, Jonathan Ennis, for this Ukraine War news update. Second part there for the 29th of August, 2024. Let's start with where we normally start, and apologies for being a little bit later than normal. I did my mapping update first. With We're going to start with the Ukrainian general stuff figures, all the usual caveats apply to these. Uh, we have... And those caveats indeed listed in the description below. 1,200 personnel lost is a fairly high number. Someone did make an interesting comment. And I actually think there might be something to this. So always wondering about the accuracy of these claims. And I've long said that the personnel numbers are going to be the most guesstimated. There will be elements of, you know, really not knowing how much damage was done to to what say you strike a building and you're thinking so first of all you think there might be 30 people inside you've seen people go in go out you don't know how many were there originally but you think okay that's a, a building with 30 people in and you smack it with some high mars attack and shelling whatever you you don't know what happened inside so you're like mm, i'm imagining say 20 of those were taken out we saw a few people escape but not everyone, I'm guessing 20 people there would either died or were injured. And so you not shout up as 20. How accurate is that? How, how, I mean, do you know whether most of those people were actually injured, were able to be rescued later and could go back and fight within a week? You know, there's so much guesstimation involved. And someone was saying that with the, with the stats, with the general staff stats, they are really quite consistent. And you would expect far greater spikes as we see with, say, tanks. So tanks is an interesting one. Certain days like today, we have three tanks lost, and some days it's like 22. You know, okay, that was a really big day. That's smashing the daily average out of the water. And with all of these categories, you get quite a bit of variation. But with personnel, it's fairly consistent. Uh, we've seen, I think, one day below 1,000, like 980 or something. Uh, but every day seems to be somewhere between about 1,000 and 1,300. And I, I just think the question is, does that consistency belie a sort of um, inaccuracy? Does it, does it belie an inaccuracy? So the, take that into account. Of course, I'm, I'm trying to be accurate. I'm not trying to be pro-Ukrainian here. I mean, it would be wonderful if they're taking all that many people... Uh, you know, in terms of casualties, uh, dead and wounded, um, POWs and deserted every single day. So tanks three, um, a troop carrying AFVs, armoured fighting vehicles, 18. It's just about the daily average there. 27 artillery systems, slightly lower than we have seen, but above the daily average. About one point, probably 1.75 times the daily average. Uh, no MLRS, one anti-aircraft warfare system. And then 52 vehicles with fuel tanks and 15 pieces of special equipment. So a fairly challenging day, but actually lower in a number of these key categories than we have previously seen there. Well, we have two Andrew Perpetual loss lists, one from the day before and one from this morning. As you can see, the day before's one, which is only 18 hours ago that he released it, uh, we have a large number of Russian losses predominantly civilian losses there and ATVs civilian sorry civilian vehicles as in cars and trucks and motorcycles that have been co-opted to military use um that will you, earlier on in the war you would have said that's logistics actually these days you know if you've got motorcycles thrown in there these will be used just as often for attacks as much as logistics okay so the combat asset losses are in the turquoise down to orange, so that much, and for the Ukrainians that much. So almost a one-to-one one to one there. So it's mainly in trucks, ATVs, and civilian vehicles that the Russians are losing the, the their numbers there. Okay, with regard to the Ukrainian losses, first bunch are Starlinks and surveillance equipment. Someone's telling me that Starlinks really are a lot cheaper now. Is it they're seeing them in in Walmart or somewhere for two hundred dollars or something like that? So. Again, it goes to show that Starlinks are functionally very valuable, but in monetary terms, the cost is really the the 
uh, the monthly subscriptions as opposed to the unit itself. Now, I don't know how freely Ukraine are able to get Starlinks. I know that there are alternatives that are also being provided to Ukraine. I don't know if they're as good. Then when we come further down, we've got a UGV unmanned ground uh, vehicle, uh, a couple of howitzers and whatnot, self-propelled howitzer up there, uh, old Soviet one, a couple of tanks, um, a few Bradleys damaged, the ratio of damage to destroyed is fairly good for the Ukrainians here. Not that much equipment to really go on, but so it's it's just over 50% is damaged as opposed to destroyed. A couple of um, APCs and MRAPs there thrown in for good measure. And nothing too, too um, serious in terms of losses there. Now, when we go to the Russians, they have a damaged Strela 10. That's a short-range air defense system. Good to see Ukrainians taking that out or at least damaging it. An RLM... Um, radar a destroyed radar, radar system that is the uh, that is good to see radar capabilities be degraded then when we come down to artillery a number of d30s old old pieces of kit there and an mt12 repairer damage that's an anti-tank gun also fairly old so that tells you something uh, d uh, then we have a single tank uh, some ifes and apcs damaged destroyed um nothing too serious there a whole slew of trucks and atvs desert cross 1000-3 the golf buggies and quads as well and then most of most of those uh destroyed as opposed to damaged likewise for the civilian vehicles over 50 percent destroyed rather than damaged destroyed and abandoned so a lot of motorcycles suvs pickup trucks etc etc so Fairly bad day at the office for the Russians in terms of the, the sheer number of stuff kit that they're losing. Not too much in terms of combat losses, combat asset losses. Uh, air defense thrown in will be valuable for the Ukrainians there. Then we come on to today's stats. And we have somewhat similar numbers here where the Russians are losing more. But that's uh, largely in terms of um, civilian vehicles here. Um, and in terms of combat asset losses they are losing maybe one or two more than the ukrainians today with a few engineering vehicles to look at as well so let's go and look at the ukrainians first and we'll notice a few bits of surveillance comms equipment a recovery vehicle an excavator uh, so that shows that the russians are aiming at ukrainian fortification construction capabilities uh, we have a few tanks infantry fighting vehicles then we get on to apcs and mraps and it's mainly destroyed and abandoned which is bad news for the ukrainians two striker apcs western provided uh, or us provided apcs abandoned there uh, we have yeah basically all of this is um western provided vehicles in the apcs and mraps uh, but actually soviet stuff in the ifes and tanks uh, but as mentioned, most of it destroyed. So that's pretty challenging. All the trucks destroyed. And that's four of those by missile strike. We'll look at that. Interesting that he's got Zil 131, DAF, Yad, and a truck. I think we're, we're going to look at this in a second. I think that is uh, what some have claimed might have been a Skynex and isn't. Uh, anyway, uh, civilian vehicles, they're destroyed and um, damaged too with... Uh, at the bottom here, these black ones, remember, as I said the other day, those are civilian vehicles used by civilians. So when it's black, that is Russians purposefully attacking civilians. So these are what is commonly known as, these are war crimes. Uh, anyway, moving up to the Russian losses, we have a Sapphire electronic warfare system. I showed you that yesterday. We have a zoo park as well. And I, I show you that. I showed you, no, the Jitel yesterday. Zoo park is uh zoo park radar cost let's see how what the value so that's a 10 million uh, dollar piece of kit so that's going to be pretty high value there uh so that's good for the ukrainians recovery vehicle three engineering vehicles um so obviously the ukrainians are aiming at the russians doing their own fortification building possibly in the kursk region and um, then artillery uh, range there nothing too special some tanks including a t90m that's been destroyed that was a pretty big explosion a secondary explosion there was was pretty phenomenal that that's definitely destroyed that tank infantry fighting and that's their best tank remember 
and they're losing those at a fairly rapid rate at the moment it seems sort of picked up again uh btrs and mtlbs and whatnot so apcs and ifes quite a few uh destroyed as opposed to damaged there and then we're down to trucks and civilian vehicles and quite a lot of uh quite a lot of kit in those categories so nothing crazy valuable for the russians uh, apart from radar electronic warfare system and you could argue t90m tank as well so yet yeah, russians are losing more kit overall than the ukrainians the ukrainians are only attacking Kursk, so they're going to be expecting to lose more there russians attacking Pokrov, so they're going to be expected to be losing more in that direction um okay war vehicle tracker talks about this hangar that was uh, taken out or warehouse that was taken out with kit inside it and this is what some people thought might have been a skynex um so that was targeted oh actually i won't show you the video you get the idea because i'll get in trouble um and yeah this has been geolocated and then they're wondering exactly what was inside it so strike on a ukrainian hangar with vehicles by this kind of m airburst missile so that is exploding before it gets there to give maximal damage uh, over a wider area i'm not able to id the vehicles however there seem to be three to four vehicles in the hangar itself they directly they hit directly hit between the building with the vehicles and the one with the intact roof uh, in the Sumi region. Then he goes, someone else says that looks like a Skynex and there's a bit of an argument over whether it is. And uh, War Vehicle Tracker calls in to uh, help germinate to Ukraine, who knows his German kit. Uh, is probably in a very different place now than he was uh, two years ago with what he's doing with his life and IDing German um, kit in blown up hangars. Um, uh, anyway, I assume the Skynex tower he means the mounted Ehrlichon Ur revolver gun Mark III. Well, from the footage, you can't tell. Honestly, it could be many things. Remember that the Russian claimed loss uh, looked very, the first Russian claimed lo loss of the Skynex looked very real, but it was a loading vehicle based on the old HX truck or some kind with shell storage at the back. The fact that the Russians apparently don't show reconnaissance footage. Of these vehicles actually driving inside the hall tells me already it's likely isn't something highly valuable that's a really good point so usually when the russians say well, look we've blown up a high mars they are following this high mars it parks in a in a um in a warehouse and then they blow up the warehouse if they're not showing it going in then and not really claiming themselves it's a skynex and it's likely not a skynex otherwise you could clearly say that the shooter and other components of the skynex system would have been moved inside to hide this however three destroyed trucks beyond successfully iding them in my opinion he said basically they're just trucks however i would say maybe i'm wrong that the cabin is too large too small in relation to its width or length to match a modern hx truck which would automatically prove it's not a skynet's component i hope that helped i was already on my way to bed before running back to start my pc again so this is what osint people do it's like really it's like one in the morning and you've hit me with is this a sky next and i have to resolve that before i go to sleep i won't be able to sleep yeah that that's that's how that's how they roll um and i think these are probably although i should check that probably the four trucks that are listed in a missile strike in the uh, andrew perpetual list but anyway i just thought i'd share that with you reported that ukrainian armed forces are using anti-aircraft drones to track down landing sites of Russian reconnaissance drones, and I, I spoke about this yesterday, and instantly strike Russian UAV operators and their vehicles with HIMARS. So I, so yesterday there was one source that was talking about how it was likely that they were following drones back with other drones to get a sense of where the rear, what the rear areas look like. And I say no, it's more likely they're following back those drones to find out where those drones are coming from to hit the operators because operators are really high value targets and the problem is whenever the ukrainians start doing something like this or vice versa the other side will copy so it's very difficult to get that asymmetry maintained over time um but anyway uh yeah uh, currently the main danger for our reconnaissance drones is the enemy's air defense drones they can be quadcopters or aircraft type and they can hit either by direct ramming or or into the propeller or by using the air blast method near the target i would like to draw attention to another trick of the enemy not always the air defense drone destroys our aerial reconnaissance aircraft in some cases it accompanies it to the landing site detects the point and strikes our vehicles with high marks the enemy has a high, very high precision, high decision-making speed, and that's the important part because it won't take too long to wrap up that 
drone and get it in a van and shoot off. So they, they would need to release that high mars, need to be ready and waiting. The enemy has a very high decision making speed and from the point of detecting the field with our vehicles to the strike a few minutes pass. Now the northerners are taking out many MLRS installations hunting the hunter but it is necessary to keep in mind such a military trick of the enemy and carefully monitor the sky. Fortunately, intercepted drones are visible both visually and by technical means. Okay, so two things there at the end. They say that they are hunting down HIMARS or MLRS. I don't know if that's actually true, but that's the claim there. We haven't seen any uh, HIMARS particularly taken out. And the second claim is that we can also do a good job of intercepting these drones following ours because they're not only visually, um, you can acquire them visually, but also you can... Um, uh, acquire them as targets by technical means technological means as well now on that note a high mars destroys a russian artillery radar okay it's not you know finding a um a drone team but this is that zupak radar counter battery radar and it was spotted by drone operators from the 15th separate separate artillery reconnaissance brigade chawney liz and uh, targeted by an m142 high mars and it's yeah not long for this world so that is that zoo park that we mentioned earlier taken out now the last thing on the hits and losses a freight train in, in, from sevastopol to Simferopol or on that line was derailed by an explosion one thinks that's probably sabotage that's going to be incredibly useful for the ukrainians to have a derailment inside crimea to hit the railways there to effectively render Crimea inoperable as a as a place for logistics, that would be absolutely diamond for the uh, Ukrainians. Right now, onto distance strikes, and there was another heavy night of drones. So, what's interesting about the missile and drone usage is that uh, I've I've talked to you several times about how. Uh, the UK the Russians have been stockpiling missiles and drones. And we had that huge wave of both drones and missiles. And I was saying, right, the important thing is to look what's going to happen on the next day. And we talked about cruise missiles, about how they had uh, stockpiled over some time there. I don't know if you can see that. You probably can't quite see that. I need to ch change where my head is. But there was this gap where they were stockpiling and then released loads of missiles. But actually... That was just those missiles spread over time. And actually, when you look at that at that period of time, over the last, sort of, I guess, year, really, they are not firing the missiles at the rate that they had previously done. And earlier on, they weren't really counting the missiles. So this is probably the case that these missiles were spread out. This usage was spread out right to the beginning, but they weren't, weren't really counting them. Uh, and then I just think that they've struggled to procure and, you know, manufacture the missiles at the rates they would want and so they had to wait a long time to have these big attacks so there was a huge uh gap there before that attack in in the previous year or no that was earlier this year and then it was that january this year and likewise this huge attack yes it was a record-breaking attack but it came on the back of a period of not sending any missile many missiles at all and then prior to that a low amount there and a low amount in this area and a low amount there so their procurement and manufacturing i think is affected and then when we look at drones uh, i wonder if we're going to see a similar thing i mean it's it's a little bit difficult to tell um because actually they use an awful lot more drones than they do um cruise missiles but yeah well actually that's an interesting story there. So it seems much more apparent that they can produce drones at an increased number than they can missiles. And that's represented by the steep curve, thanks to Dell, who does all these, these stats presentations. And they are linked on every of my first, certainly first video of the day in the description below. So you can go and mess around, not mess around with them, you can go and check them out. Now, what you see here is an increased number of drones, predominantly... Uh, these are going to be attack drones. I think they do include reconnaissance drones and lancers sometimes in their stats, and that's really annoying because, I mean, for 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 what I want, because it's all about me, right? I want I would like just you um, OWAs, one way attack drones, like the Shahids. Now, what's important to note is that not only have they been trying to get as many from Iran as possible, but they now make these indigenously in Russia. And they are relatively easy to make and probably don't need the components that things like cruise missiles and hypersonic 
missiles need. So it's a lot easier to make these and it appears that Russia is able to produce these and use them at fairly significant levels. Now that is then, now when we feed that knowledge back into this, we have seen the third out of the fourth. So we've had four nights and three of the four nights, the Russians have sent an absolute ton of Shahid drones into, into Ukraine. So 74 Shahids were sent last night. 60 were taken out, intercepted, blown up, taken down. Of course, they're still going to fall and cause fire and damage when they fall, if they fall over urban areas. 14 of them didn't reach their targets. Electronic warfare is going to be playing a part. Some were actually lost in Belarus, or at least one in Belarus. We'll talk about that in a second. Um and so that means potentially 100% of the drones did not do what they were hoping, what the Russians were hoping they would do and hit their intended targets. However, it does show that they're able to produce and procure lots and lots of drones. So three out of the four nights, you've got drones of this kind of number, uh, over 100 on the first night, so 109 drones on the first night. And then uh, was it eight, 80 drones the second night? but only 10 missiles. So that you've got two stories going on here. You've got a lack of ability to produce missiles because it went from 126 or something the first night and then 10 the second night. And I said that morning, watch how many missiles are sent tonight. That will tell you what you need to know. And then very few missiles on subsequent three nights. Okay, so 10 down to like three missiles sent last night. But the but the drones, I think they took a night off, but basically you've had 109, maybe 80, I don't know, and then, or 40, or so a, a large amount of drones, and last night 74. So they are able to procure significant drone numbers reflected in Dell's stats there. Even though the Ukrainians have been seen to hit some drone storage facilities that have blown up a bunch of these drones, but clearly that doesn't really... Uh, have the uh, desired enough effect. By right, air defense shot down two out of the three KH-59 or 69 guided missiles, 60 out of the 74 drones, another 14 drones were lost in Ukraine, or indeed in Belarus. The air defense system was operating in Kharkiv, Chukasi, Kivaret, like basically everywhere. Now, there was, well, okay, first of all, people were in the metros again. Uh, you know, it's the set one of the safest places in Kiev. So Kiev was targeted, uh, one of the most targeted places in the night and during the morning. Metro stations were full of people. Air defense seems to have done a good job. Many witnessed the shooting down of drones over Kiev. Perhaps 15 in total were successfully brought down over Kiev. Of course, shot down drones fall to earth and cause damage in Kiev. One caused a fire in a children's playground between apartment blocks. Most blocks have such shaded air shared areas. Another hit a gazebo while this person saw debris land next to his home so yeah remember that then we have this story of belarus shooting down a russian shahid drone in it over its territory with the help of aviation for the first time that's the belarusian hajim project declaring that it's reported that on the night of the 29th during another russian attack on ukraine one of the shahid drones flew into the territory of belarus in the yelsk district of khomel region uh, after the drone entered the airspace of Belarus, a fighter of the Belarusian Air Force chased it for about 20 minutes and then at least two explosions were heard and a bright flash in the sky was observed. No official confirmation of this, but that's interesting because even Poland won't do that at the moment. They held off the other day and then it disappeared and so they couldn't do it. They might have done it. They were kind of toying with the idea of shooting one down over, over Poland. And here we've got the Belarusians like who are supposedly allies of Russia shooting down a Russian drone over Belarusian territory. Maybe it had gone off on one and it was going to fall on Belarusian territory. Well, the Polish could use that same argument. Um, but yeah, a Ukrainian MiG-24 shooting down a Russian Shahid drone. Another bit of footage of air defense being done by aircraft, such as both fixed wing and rotary aircraft. Here, the MiG-24 shooting it down by the looks of it with its own um, that pod I think it's got at the at the nose of the helicopter and the machine gun there rather than someone firing out the side we'd seen both so yeah just sort of throw that one in now in Chikasi rescuers extinguished the fire at an enterprise with an area of 2,000 square meters uh, according to state emergency services 75 rescuers and 21 pieces of firefighting equipment were involved who knows whether that was as a result of just falling debris 
Um, or well, if all 74 were intercepted and only one missile got through, could that be the missile that got through? Could it be the missile that fell to the ground and caused this kind of devastation? And that's a problem with what goes up must come down reality of ordnance flying through your airspace. Russian attacks across Ukraine killed five civilians and injured 43 over the past 24 hours. So that, you know, it's just this constant attrition of civilian um, spirit and uh, life and, and infrastructure. Now, remember yesterday I reported that so on this is the flip side and I get the sense that the screw must be turning for the Russians. We had this power plant that there's an explosion there. No real knowledge as to what caused that explosion, whether it was the Ukrainians aiming at it, but that was in Kazan. And that is a sizable bit of damage. Possibly Russian OPSEC since then haven't heard anything else of that. A local taking a uh, some imagery and saying basically it's effed and then, you know, going off on one about that. Something effed up the power plant. That was the that was an effing pop. And now it's burning. In other words, it sounded like there's an explosion. Could that be a missile? Could that be a drone? Or was it just an explosion at the power plant? Was it sabotage? Was it poor maintenance? So that's the Russian city of Novomichurinsk in the Ryazan region. And that goes, that gets added on to, and now this is something that I meant to report about, was it four days ago? And I obviously lost the link. Sometimes I accidentally don't copy links over from where they should. And there are certain things like, oh, I, I meant to say that the other day, but I didn't say it. And it's because I mess up the links. This is one of them. So uh, I, I've went and found it. And this is super important. So there are three Boik towers in the Black Sea, and these are gas production platforms. So luckily not oil in a way that you would cause an oil slick over the Black Sea. So these gas production platforms are all burning. And this has happened on the sly, right? And these are ones that are still run by the Russians. The so-called Boik rigs, which were liberated by the Ukrainian military in September 2023, well, it says they're liberated. All three drilling rigs have been attacked east of Snake Island as of August 24. Oh, no, I might be interpreting that the wrong way. So these are Ukrainian gas rigs. Now, they're under control of the Ukrainians. I don't know that they're working, though. I think these were being used as air defense platforms so that they could take down Russian airframes flying over the Black Sea. Now, all three drilling rigs have been attacked east of Snake Island. So we heard that Snake Island was attacked the other day. As of the August 24th, 2024, the middle rig is on fire and the plume of smoke is coming from the third rig, according to OSINT analyst N.T. Anderson. And he was a guy that I was I had originally uh, looked at. Anyway, he reported on uh, Twitter and posted the satellite images. So Ukraine reg regained control of those oil and gas drilling platforms off the coast of Annex Crimea in September 2023. And here they are. Here's what um, N.T. Anderson produced. And yeah, satellite image of burning jack-up rigs, Tavrida and Krim-1, uh, hit by a KH-22 missiles on August 24th, located east of Snake Island. The rigs have been used by Ukrainian GUR for military purposes since summer. So I don't think that they are being used for hydrocarbon purposes. As mentioned, they launch attacks from there or they use them for air defense. But they have been struck by the Russians and are burning. And that's obviously bad news for the Ukrainians. And I was thinking that's bad news for the Russians. That's why I put it there. So apologies, my, my mess up there. Now, uh, but back to the Ukrainians striking the energy infrastructure of the Russians, the Atlas Old Depot that wasn't hit last night, it's hit the night before, it's still on fire. It was a massive explosion there last night. And I think it was another one of those oil reservoirs just exploding. Apparently, you could see the glow for 150 kilometers absolutely huge and the, the imagery coming from there is just sensational uh, ter terrible um the fire at the old depot kamensky district of rostov region continues to burn at night the fourth tank was depressurized three were already burning um and then today the smoke from the fire at the old depot at rostov region stretches up for 30 kilometers local telegram channels report the fire spread to other reservoirs and uh, yeah, the other tanks nearby are supposedly now on fire. So that is not under control. On the flip side, going back to what Russia has done to Ukraine in terms of hitting or trying to hit critical energy infrastructure, there's not a single hydroelectric power plant in Ukraine that has not been attacked by the enemy, says the CEO of Ukraine, uh, so the hydroelectric power company of 
of Ukraine. More than 130 missile strikes have been launched against our generation. That's just the hydroelectric generation. According to him, Ukrainian hydroelectric electric power plants lost 40% of their generation and thermal plants more than 80%. Uh, so that is, they are under massive, massive pressure. And then going back to Russia, on the flip side, Russian propaganda network TASS has reported or is reporting that Russian oil, diesel and coal production numbers will now be a state secret. Oh, who knew? And you can understand that. The Russians want to keep a lid on what information gets out there because absolutely rest assured that their oil production and storage will be massively compromised by the activities of the last well I'd say the last few weeks but actually really the last few years uh, incredible particularly the last year where the Ukrainians have really started aiming at those depots and refineries Right, going on to other bits and pieces, worth noting here uh, some imagery from someone driving over the Kerch Bridge that Russians have placed Pantsir S1, so these are fairly decent air defence units there, uh, which on, on the bridge and by the bridge, which shows you that they are genuinely worried about uh, strikes on the Crimean Bridge. And as they should be, because I'd imagine it will be coming. Now, there's been an invasion, but I don't know whether the invasion is into Crimea or off Crimea and an incursion into Russia. But there's a significant incursion here, and I think you should all take note of this. So it turns out a bear, uh, maybe maybe the local wildlife has just haven't had enough of Russian rule. But here we have a bear running across a Crimean bridge here. I don't know which direction, but it's an incursion I think the Russians should worry about. It makes me sad, actually. This this is clearly out of its comfort zone. Uh, running alongside traffic is probably panicked. It's quite sad. Uh, but anyway, uh, that is happening. Uh, Russians are... So I talked about this a little bit on my m mapping update. So Russians are noticing rather suspiciously... Uh, the, or the, the rather suspicious fast retreat of the Ukrainian armed forces from Donbass and think that something is up with that given the availability of at least some reserves for the Ukrainians that are not being deployed. So these, this is what Russians are saying. My tuppence that I've already uh, explained to you is there's a kind of game of military um, military chicken going on with the forces at Prokrosk and Kursk. Who will crumble first? Will it be the Russians or the Ukrainians? Who will want to take forces away from one of those places to supply the other place? And at the moment, people are worrying that, one, the Ukrainians are ceding territory quite rapidly in the Donbass area. The Russians are advancing rather quickly. And that's super worrying. When there are troops available, potentially, to shore up those defences, why aren't they? And then that's raising suspicions for the Russians. On the other hand, on Russian TV, this is Vladimir Solovyev. Uh, and another propagandist, Mahiv, discuss how the incursion into Kursk is causing, quote, demoralization among the people who are losing faith in the Russian authorities' ability to protect them. As a response, they call for strikes on public gatherings celebrating Independence Day in Ukraine. Just remember how often the Russian propagandists advocate for genocide and war crimes. Just remember that. And if you are someone who's still supporting the Russians, take a long, hard look at yourself in a moral mirror. Okay, meanwhile, for more than three weeks now, the Ukrainian armed forces have continued to advance in the Kursk region. And judging by Russian reports, the pressure is not decreasing. Now, I don't know about this because they're certainly taking less land than they were by quite a, a large measure. They are only making incremental gains on a daily basis now. But I guess that doesn't mean that the pressure is still not there. There's just a lot of pressure for less land. Uh, for, but yeah, the, the Ukrainians are still there, still plugging away. Um, it's been admitted by the U U a Ukrainian military spokesman that Russia has now gained about 40% of Chadzhiv Yard. I've not seen this in my mapping updates, but I'll check out today's mapping updates and see if there's an increase. That would be really bad news for the Ukrainians because I thought that they had put a, uh, a stop to the Russian advances there and that the Russians had taken troops from, Kur from Chadzhiv Yard sorry, and taken them up to Kursk to help defend Kursk. So I could have been wrong. About, well, not wrong about that, but wrong about the, the amount of effect it might or might not have had. Well, things change though. Uh, Russia faces difficult fight to retake the territory in Kursk or Blast, according to the deputy CIA director. As Kiev's incursion into Kursk enters its fourth week, Ukraine is reportedly in control of about 1,300 square kilometres and 100 settlements. And it could be that that is just 
uh, going to be very difficult for the Russians to get back. Now, lastly, this is what my mate Andy, uh, Andy Jordan, and Benny Pie sent me. So thanks, Ben. Uh, lonely. De well, not thanks for something horrible. It's really sad. This the lonely death of a jailed Russian pianist who opposed the war. While the U.S. and Russia were busy finalizing the biggest exchange of prisoners since the Cold War, gifted but little-known Russian pianist was dying in silence in jail. Uh, Pavel Kushnir uh, had protested repeatedly against Russia's invasion of Ukraine and began a hunger strike soon after his arrest in May, later refusing water as well. He died slowly and without publicity on July the 28th, four days before a group of better-known dissidents were swapped for Kremlin spies, sleeper agents and killers imprisoned in the West. After his lonely death at the pre-trial detention centre in Birodbidjan, in Russia's far east, the 39-year-old was mourned by only 11 people at his cremation. Svetlana Kavarazina, an independent politician in Siberia, said no one had tried to talk to him out of sacrificing him, talk him out of sacrificing himself because they hadn't been aware of what was happening. We couldn't chip in and send him a lawyer. We didn't know, she wrote on the Telegram messaging app. He was alone. The YouTube channel where Kushnir published four anti-war videos had only five subscribers when he was arrested. His foreign agent Mulder posts were a reference to a character of the US TV series The X-Files, which was popular in Russia in the 90s and also in Russian law, um, also to a Russian law that follows people considering politically sus suspect to, considered politically suspect to be declared foreign agents, so that it's a foreign agent law that we've seen elsewhere. In one clip, Kushnir even appears with a hand-drawn FBI badge. His final film, released in January, addressed the 2022 massacre of civilians by Russian troops in Bucha, a suburb of Kiev. A few months later, a Telegram channel close to the Secret Service's operational reports posted a video showing marked men leading Kushnir into a white minivan. It added that a criminal case has been opened, accusing him of making a public call to engage in terrorist activity, which is punishable by up to seven years in jail. Nothing more was heard until the 2nd of August, when human rights activist Olga Romanova, uh, the pianist friend as, uh, and the pianist friend Olga uh, Shkriganova, uh, revealed the de his death in an article published online in Vot's Tack. And his 79-year-old mother confirmed it as well. So uh, what he also did was spent uh, his free time protesting against the war. In emails to friends, he described sticking posters into around Birodbijan at night with slogans angrily denouncing the draft. His, uh, the and describing Putin as a fascist. He also began staging hunger strikes, first for 20 days in spring uh, 2023 and then for, for three months later that year. His friend says Kushnir knew the danger he was putting himself in. It was, a, it was a solitary protest, an act by someone who didn't know what else he could do. She tried to convince him to leave Russia, or at least to perform in, in Berlin, where she now lives, but they never managed to arrange a trip. In late March, Kushnir spoke to her for the last time, telling her that he felt like he was being watched and that he was kept seeing the same person. Whatever happens, happens, he said. I'm doing this for a reason. Now, I just wanted to give a little bit of detail there to remind people that one, not all Russians are the same. Sometimes, and I'm just as guilty of tarring all Russians with the same brush. There are good Russians, there are good Russians around the world who oppose this war, and there are good Russians in, in Russia who oppose this war. But it's so difficult to be a good Russian opposing a war in Russia because you are likely to be rounded up and sentenced for the rest of your life or a very long time and you might well end up dying. Here we have someone who was truly heroic, uh, giving up his life and then even when he was imprisoned, going on hunger strike and water strike, what good did that do him? What good did it do the world? I don't know, but it was the only control he could have that he felt he could have, I imagine. And the only way he could say, look, what is going on is not good enough. It is disgusting. And there he stood against uh, the genocidal inclinations of his dictator leader, Vladimir Putin. And he paid the ultimate price for it. And he, in his own way, in his own very solitary way, he truly was a hero. So well worth being cognizant of these stories and it's important these stories don't just die a death with their protagonist. So thanks for people for sending that to me. Anyway, enough from me. Take care, everybody. Speak soon. Toodle pips.